It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Uh, Kalpesh Parmer is a 46-year-old father of two. He has worked as a security guard for the last six years. Kalpesh says, before the new decent work laws, when I had back pain, I couldn't afford to get treatment. We didn't have bargaining protection. Now we do, and the quality of life is better. Speaker, now that the Premier has said that he'll scrap the rules that provide these protections for workers across our province, what does the Premier have to say to workers like Kalpesh? Premier. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, and to the member of Brampton Centre, what I have to say to your friend there that came up to you is they can expect, they can expect to hold on to their job instead of losing their job. TD Economics came out and said there's going to be 80 to 90,000 people that are going to lose their job. I'm guessing already 60,000 people have already lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. What we can tell your, your friend in, in Brampton Centre is that their gas prices just dropped down five cents per litre because of the cap and trade. You can, You can tell your friend he's actually going to save $850 because he won't be on the tax roll anymore. It, they'll have zero tax. You can tell your friend that when he goes to pay his hydro bill, Bonds? it's going to be down $280. We've saved $750 million a year. You know something, Mr. Speaker? My daughter, my daughter sent over her union gas bill. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I can appreciate the comments that the Premier is making, but let's hear a little bit more from Calpresh. Before the minimum wage increase, it was very hard to survive. When buying anything, I had to think, is it necessary for me? I can't think of the last time I even bought myself a new T-shirt. Since the Premier has never once spoken with anyone about his plans to tear up the new rules, especially people that would actually benefit from a higher minimum wage or paid sick days or emergency leave, what does the Premier say to Calpish and the 1.7 million workers just like him? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and what the uh, member from Brampton Centre didn't have an opportunity to do that we had an opportunity, but their leader did, is go around the province and talk to small business owners that laid people off, talk to the restaurants, talk to the little home hardware that laid people off. Thousands and thousands of businesses across this province, people lost their jobs. Because you can't, I, I know the, the, the opposition doesn't understand economics, no, not at all. but you can't automatically in one year increase salaries by 22 percent and then increase them 32 percent. Just imagine if everyone's cost increased by 32 percent. It's not realistic. We're going to create good paying jobs. We're going to make sure that the part-time person gets treated very well. But you have to keep in mind the person that's been working there 15 years. You can't treat a part-timer the same way you treat someone that's been Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Premier, uh, Premier uh, Kalpesh is one of a million Ontario workers who move this province forward every single day. He doesn't get invited to your consultations, but he works hard and plays by the rules. Is it too much to ask that he be allowed to take a sick day? without worrying about lost pay and how he's going to cover his bills at the end of the month, or an emergency day during a family crisis, or that he earn a $15 minimum wage. Premier, is that too much to ask for workers across this province? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, we're going to protect Kalpash. We're going to protect people like that by, again, lowering their taxes, saving on that green energy scam the millions and millions of dollars that the province wasted. $750 million on the hydro, just $750 million on the hydro alone. We're going to create good paying jobs so Cal Pash doesn't have to stay on minimum wage. He can work his way up the ladder. He can be a manager. I, 
I've seen it over and over again in business. Someone might start at a lower level, work their way up to middle manager, manager, and then they could be running the show. That's what democracy is about. That's what free enterprise is about, is giving Fox. everyone an opportunity to grow. We live in the greatest country, the greatest province in the world. Stop the clock. Start the clock. The member for Nike, Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Mr. Speaker, and my question is for the Premier. Uh, in the city of Hamilton, a code zero is issued when there's only one ambulance available or, in fact, none at all. Can the Premier please tell us how many code zeros were issued last week in the city of Hamilton? Premier. Uh, Minister of Community Safety Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the question. We take public safety as a paramount concern in the province. One of the things that we do is ensure that we provide resources to our frontline, uh, off, uh, our frontline officers and, our, and the people that provide frontline services to ensure that they have the ability to do their jobs. That's something that we've done, we will continue to do, and we will continue to provide those services and that support to make sure that the frontline responders, all of our frontline responders, have the ability to complete and do their work. Supplementary. Well, I appreciate the attempt at an answer, but this is about health care, not about safety and security. The City of Hamilton, in fact, experienced five Code Zero events last week. Thursday's Code Zero lasted more than two hours, wow. and Hamilton's chief paramedic says it's an issue of hospital flow. Patients are stuck waiting on stretchers for more than two hours while hospitals scramble to find space. Premier, we know this isn't new. Where is the plan to deal with this ongoing crisis? Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to refer the matter to the Minister of Tourism. Minister of Tourism. Thank you. Clearly, we cannot have code zeros happening in our hospitals throughout the province. We understand that. We also understand that the city of Hamilton is actually responsible for their ambulance services. We will work with their, those partners. We will ensure that they get the resources they need. But Order. let's be clear. This is not a new problem. Order this has not just benches. happened this weekend, Speaker. This is a 15-year problem that's going to take some time. We're going to get it right, and we're going to make sure that we provide the services the city of Hamilton needs. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Well, this is clearly not an issue for tourism, but I would suggest maybe this government might want to take a tour of some of the hospitals in Ontario. Because this isn't just a Hamilton problem. The Ottawa Hospital, for example, was at 104 percent capacity on Thursday. The Thunder Bay's hospital just reported that they were operating over capacity 94 percent of the time. These hospitals are saying that repackaging the same old Liberal announcements won't get people out of hospital hallways. When are we going to see a plan? Minister. You know, I, I would not presuppose to try to figure out how the opposite uh, party organizes themselves, but I can assure you that a Doug Ford government works as a team. We are a strong caucus, a strong party. We work together to solve these issues. As I said, we will work with our municipal partners, including the City of Hamilton, to ensure they have the resources they need. But to be clear, 
This is not a new problem. 15 years of inaction, 15 years of, of lack of, of any kind of Order. focus, and this is what you're dealt with. If you'd like to ask why the Liberals ignored it for 15 years, go right ahead. But in our first 100 days, we are dealing with the issues that the people of Ontario expect us to deal with, including hallway medicine. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Hamilton Mayor noted that his community still doesn't know whether they're going to get any of the $90 million surge capacity hospital funding announcement. It's a concern that I've heard over and over, from Thunder Bay to Ottawa to Hamilton and every communities in between. Can the Premier provide any details as to where the $90 million in search capacities for a hospital that he announced, where are this money going to be spent? Of tourism, culture and sport. Now, when we announced the surge funding, we did it with the cooperation and, and feedback from the local LINs, because we need to make sure that that surge funding is going to the communities that are most in need. I'm actually very proud of the fact that I spent last week in my constituency talking to the people in my riding, and they said, good on you for finally actually doing something before the flu season becomes a problem and people continue to be treated in hallways. We are proactively trying to deal with that. We've chosen certain areas throughout the province where we already see through the work of the LINs that there are going to be problems. Historically, there have been problems, and that's why we've chosen the communities that we've had. It's only a first step, but it's an important first step, and it sends the message Response. that we are on the job and we want to protect this stuff before the, the flu season is upon us. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. The Premier $90 million commitment won't stretch very far. Last year, Kathleen Wynne flu season funding didn't make a dent in hallway medicine. The Premier's plan is $10 million less than last year, while more of our hospitals, over half of them actually, are now operating in overcapacity status every single night. And that's before you consider the impact of health care cuts. Does the Premier really think that $90 million to cover the surge linked to the flu season will end hallway medicine or will improve the situation in our overcrowded hospitals? I wish to remind all members that we refer to other members not by their given names but by their riding names or their ministry title. Response, Minister. Respectfully, Speaker, I must correct the member opposite. This is new money. This is very specifically for the upcoming flu season. We are proactively getting the resources in place so that hospitals like Bridgepoint, North Bay Regional Health Care Centre, Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences, Pine Villa, Cooksville Care Centre, Humber River Hospital can prepare appropriately for the flu season and so that we can stop treating our parents, our grandparents in hallways and in closets. It's inappropriate. It shouldn't be happening. And last week's announcement was a first step towards that change. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Kitchener Conestoga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Our government is committed to putting more money back into people's pockets. For the last 15 years, the previous Liberal government took every opportunity to tax the hardworking people of Ontario. The pattern was clear. The Liberals would tax and the Liberals would spend, and the people of Ontario would lose. I'm, bo I'm both happy and relieved our government is putting an end to the Liberals' reckless tax and spend policies. For example, last week our government announced our intention to halt the beer tax increase. 
Could the minister please explain his intention to stop the cost of beer from going up and how this will save the people of Ontario more money? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kitchener-Conestoga for the question. Every year for the past three years, the Liberals have increased the beer tax on November 1. They took every opportunity to squeeze more money out of the hardworking people across our province, all in an effort to keep up with their reckless spending. Last week, our government announced our intention to put an end to yet another Liberal cash grab. Our, our plan proposes to stop the three cents per litre tax hike on beer on November 1st. Instead, we're letting the people of Ontario hold on to more of their hard-earned money. The days of the tax-and-spend Liberals are over. We're respecting the taxpayer, we're lowering taxes, and we're putting more money in people's pockets every single chance we get. Speaker. Order. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. I'm thrilled to be part of a government that is putting the people first. An annual beer tax hike that is nothing more than an opportunity for the Liberals to finance their reckless spending and failed policies. It's about time the people of Ontario get the relief they deserve. For too long, taxpayers' pockets were treated like a piggy bank. The Liberals were taking whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. I'm proud our government is doing things differently. I'm proud our government is respecting the taxpayer. The beer tax hike was just another example of the Liberals making life more unaffor unaffordable for Ontario families. Could the minister further explain why the plan to stop the beer tax hike increase is necessary? Minister. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Our proposed plan to stop the beer tax hike is part of our commitment to putting more money in people's pockets. Speaker, we're bringing relief to the people of Ontario every single chance we get. We've introduced legislation to scrap cap and trade, which, if passed, would bring further relief at the pump and in families' wallets. We've rolled back increases for driver's license renewal fees. We've cancelled expensive wind and solar projects in order to bring down hydro rates. Every single decision we make and every single dollar we spend is for the people. The beer tax is no different. We will continue to provide relief in every way we can and let the hard-working people of Ontario keep more money in their pockets. Speaker. Order. <laughs> Next question. Start the clock. The member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, as the Premier knows, Faith Goldie is a neo-Nazi sympathizer who the Premier posed for photos with at an event several weeks ago. Now that photo is being used on campaign advertising to promote Faith Goldie's campaign as Toronto Mayor. Yeah. Speaker, the people of Ontario want to know, did the Premier give permission for his image to be used in Faith Goldie's campaign advertising? Premier. I thought you wanted to talk about policies. You know, Through you, Mr. Reduction. Speaker. I can tell you, I'm not going down that alley again. I'll tell you where I'm going. I look forward to working with the next mayor of Toronto. I look forward to working with a reduced size of council, a dysfunctional council before. Now we're going to be able to work with the province to get transit built, to get housing built, to actually save the taxpayers some money. Believe me, I know that game at City Hall like the back of my hand, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. And hopefully they're going to get things done once and for all. Here, here. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the advertisement in question is in Chinese, and that's especially concerning given that, uh, other, among other hateful things, Faith Goldie has recently stated, quote, that Toronto shouldn't be a suburb 
of Beijing. Whoa. She's implying that she has the endorsement of this Premier. And the Premier now, again, has a chance to clear the air. It shouldn't be this hard, Speaker. It can't be this hard. Will the Premier unequivocally denounce Faith Goldie and apologize for appearing in a photo that is now being used as a de facto endorsement of her campaign for the pre of the, from the Premier of this province? Premier. Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister of I'd Children, like to point Community out to the member opposite Services. that this Premier has Order. disavowed that individual no less than 20 times in this assembly. And I reject the premise where that government is trying to say this party is anti immigration. Look around these benches like that. This party is full of diversity. This party welcomes diversity. This party is Please come to order. The member for Flamborough Glanbrook, please come to order. The Premier will come to order. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, come to order. Member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come to order. Start the clock. The member for Simcoe North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, our brave, dedicated, and hardworking frontline officers and emergency responders have faced incredible pressure due to constant failures associated with their communications network, known as the Public Safety Radio Network. Our dedicated frontline officers and emergency responders deserve to know that our government is listening to them and remains committed to providing them with the tools they need to perform their duties safely and effectively. Right. Ontarians also deserve to know that their government is able to provide them with the level of public safety they expect us to provide them with. To the Minister, can you please update the members of this Legislature on the current state of Ontario's public safety radio network? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Great news, Mike. Great news. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member of Simcoe North for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Public Safety Network has been left in a terrible state of disrepair. The last time the network was replaced was back in 1998. The project is long overdue. We're taking real action to ensure that our government can provide the people of this great province with the level of public safety they expect us to provide them with. Due to the current state of the PSRN, any delay in modernizing the system increases the risk to public safety as a result of radio failures, so it's critical that we move forward with this project as soon as possible. The safety of Ontarians will always be our first priority. A mitigation strategy has now been put in place to ensure the current radio network can still be used until the new system is phased in in 2021. Public safety is a top priority, Mr. Speaker, of this government, and Response. we will do everything in our power to ensure that the radio network is up and running and working for all Ontarians. Thank here, you. Here. Supplementary. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for his response and for working to keep our frontline officers and communities safe. It is unacceptable to hear the previous Liberal government ignored such important communications infrastructure for so long. It is very reassuring to hear that our government for the people has moved so quickly to ensure that our frontline officers and emergency personnel 
are able to better communicate and respond to emergency situations. I am also pleased to learn that a mitigation strategy has been put in place while the network is being modernized to ensure the safety of families and communities across Ontario. To the minister, could you please tell the members of this legislature how long it will take to modernize the public safety radio network? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that follow-up question. Our government for the people acted as quickly as possible to ensure that the province's public safety radio network could be replaced and modernized to keep Ontario's communities safe. This project is a massive undertaking. The technology that provides essential public safety radio coverage across the province will be re rebuilt by this government. Mr. Speaker, the new network will be a 15-year service agreement to ensure wow. that our network remains up to date and in good repair. In addition, funding has been set aside to improve the existing legacy system during the transition to the new system. Mr. Speaker, our frontline and emergency responders do some of the most dangerous work in the province. They need to have the tools Spons. and resources in place to do their jobs. Our government for the people is making sure that they have the necessary tools to be able to do their job safely. Thank you. Next question, the member for Orléans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Public Security and community safety. Well, the cancellation of certification requirements for firefighters make absolutely no sense. In response to several tragic incidents and recommendations from coroner's inquest and the request of firefighters, mandatory training requirements were put in place. Mandatory training is not just raised up red tape like the Conservative likes to refer. It keeps firefighters and the community safe as they serve. In fact, Rob Einman, the president of the Ontario Professional Firefighters Association, said that these regulations were necessary to save lives. Mr. Speaker, we have seen what happens when rules to keep people safe are called red tapes by the Conservatives. So does the minister believe that his government's insistence Question. on cutting so-called red tape is worth the lives of Ontario's firefighters? Good question. Minister of Community Safety. Mr. Speaker, listening to the question begs me to ask the question back. What exactly is it that they are trying to do? What we are trying to do as a government is be responsible and ensure that our firefighters are safe. What that means is that we will look at certification, but what we are also doing is listening to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. And at their annual conference, we heard from them and from other stakeholders, including fire chiefs, that the certification reg regulation would, re would create significant challenge challenges for fire services and municipalities, and particularly small, rural, and northern municipalities with volunteer firefighters. Firefighters Response. and the municipalities have expressed concern with the resources and supports that were required to be compliant with the certification requirements and the potential longer-term— Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. So, so Mr. Speaker, Actually, I'm happy about the answer that the minister is saying because actually we were going the former government that was here confirmed to the AMO to every single individuals who were consulted for the past 18 months on this at a fire table at expert fire so AMO was there the volunteer firefighter was there the fire chief were there every single individuals were sitting at this table and we came to the table saying that we were going to help our most vulnerable rural and a far away community, Mr. Speaker. So, again, to the minister, what's the cost of not helping firefighters? And I want to remind everyone in Ontario cost of safety. when you go to the barber or to your hairdresser, they actually yeah. have a minimum requirement of standard. So, again, to the minister, what are you going to do to help firefighters in this province safety. to keep them safe? Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, our government is a responsible government and will work with the firefighters, the municipalities, to ensure that they're here. safe. Exactly. I find it rich that I'm listening to the former Liberal caucus talk about the fact that they were going to spend all this money. Well, let me remind you about the $354 billion debt. And let me also remind you of the $15 billion deficit that we operate with. The reality of the situation is we are listening to the stakeholders, we are listening to the fire chiefs, and I've had numerous discussions where they've told me and congratulated our government for taking the lid off of a boiling pot. We are working with the firefighters, and we will give them real results. Order. Restart the clock. I recognize the member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Last week, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its latest report. Ninety scientists reviewed over 6,000 climate studies to compile the world's most comprehensive understanding of the risks we face from climate change. Its conclusion. We need to keep the rise in global temperatures to 1.5 degrees if we're to avoid the most catastrophic impacts. Ontario once had a plan to mitigate climate change. Then the Premier ripped up the plan and replaced it with nothing. Did the minister read the conclusions reached by the IPCC? And if so, how is it acceptable that Ontario no longer has a climate plan? To the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, and I thank him for the question. Paul Miller. Um, as the member knows, this is a 700-page study. Oh, it is a study question. that's being reviewed now by, by the ministry team, and like the, all the other information, will be integrated into our planning, our planning for a plan that works, not the cap-and-trade carbon tax plan that was rejected by the people of Ontario, but yep. a plan that works. But, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you what is really shocking is that the previous government, supported 97 per cent by the NDP, yep. did not prepare a comprehensive climate yes. review in terms of the impacts on the province of Ontario. I was shocked to find that with all of the attention paid to it and supported 97 per cent of the time by the NDP, yes. that there's no comprehensive review of yes. how we're going to deal they with these impacts. The Mr. Speaker, climate change is real. Our plan will deal with the impacts, yeah, yeah. unlike the previous government. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the minister. The NDP supports climate action that is fair, effective, and transparent. The minister doesn't seem to support climate action at all. Ontario's environment commissioner said, and I quote, Ontario has gutted most of its climate change programs, unquote. When so much is at stake, why is the minister gutting Ontario's climate change action plan without putting forward an alternative plan? Minister. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member. Climate change is real and we are addressing it, but we're addressing it with an effective Made in Ontario plan. Mr. Speaker, there are two things that are clear. First, we need to build resilience. We need to understand the impacts of climate change because it's happening. Second, we need to deal with reductions in greenhouse gases, but reductions that provide a balance, a balance between a healthy economy and a healthy environment. Our Made in Ontario plan will bring forward those changes, and we'll look forward to the members' comments when the plan is released. Here, here. Thank you. Next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the wonderful and talented Attorney General. We know that the Trudeau government has mandated that recreational cannabis be legal across Canada on October 17th. And I know that our government has been hard at work developing a plan that ensures our province is ready for legalization this Wednesday. A plan that will protect our children, keep our roads and communities safe, and combat the illegal market. But I also know that many parents and young people in my riding of Willowdale still have questions about what the federal Liberal government's legalization of this drug means and what it'll mean for families and their communities. I know our government has made many announcements on this topic, which have been helpful, 
But I'm wondering if the Attorney General can highlight any further places that people may be able Question. to learn more about the government's plan. The Attorney General. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the, man, the man, member from Willowdale for his question. Uh, with the federal government's legalization of cannabis only two short days away on October 17th, I would like to start by reassuring this chamber and all Ontarians that this province will be ready. I understand that parents and young people have questions about the federal government's legalization policy. As a mother of four children myself, I have thought about how this policy will affect my family. And so I know that, like so many others, I'd like to have as much information as possible about how to navigate these waters, which is why I'm happy to share with the House that we have launched a public awareness campaign aimed at informing Ontarians, especially parents and young people, about the new legal framework for the purchase and consumption of recreational cannabis, Spons. about the dangers associated with drug-impaired driving and highlighting the health risks to consumers. And over the coming months, we will be rolling out more and more ads that will be accessible and apparent for people where they live and commute. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. I know that the parents of my riding will be relieved to know that the government is providing resources that they can turn to when they have questions. These are certainly uncharted waters, and it's reassuring to know that we have a government that takes this matter and the protection of our young people very seriously. Mr. Speaker, the minister mentioned the purpose of the public awareness campaign was to highlight the rules around recreational uh, cannabis use in Ontario. Can the minister outline how the new plan will better inform families and commuters on how to be safer in our communities and on our roads? Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I'd be happy to provide the member from Willowdale with more information. These ads will focus on social responsibility, including the serious health and addiction risks of short and long-term cannabis use. They will not promote cannabis use. Our message will remain simple and clear. We will plainly tell Ontarians how our children, our communities and our roads will be protected and how we will work to combat the illegal market. Here, here. The deterring effects of our zero tolerance policies will be also amplified through these ads, which will work to educate people about the dangers of driving impaired and stiff penalties. No matter where or how you hear about our government's plans, our commitment to protecting youth, keeping our communities and our roads safe, and fighting the illegal market will always be paramount. I cannot stress this enough, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is ready for the federal government's legalization of recreational cannabis. Next question, the member for Brampton East. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Ontarians living in areas like Brampton, Scarborough, Humber River, Black Creek, and York Southwestern pay disproportionately higher auto insurance premiums than drivers in any other neighborhood in the GTA. This is simply not okay. Ontario families are to pay enough, and we, have stopped, we must stop auto insurance companies from gouging families merely based on the neighborhood that they live in. Climbing daily expenses from auto insurance to hydro to housing are pushing families past the breaking point. We have to do better. This is why I will be introducing my private member's bill to end postal code discrimination in auto insurance premiums. Will the government support my private member's bill, or will they side with auto insurance companies over, over Ontario drivers? Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you to the member from Brampton East for the question. It's clear that the Liberal NDP system of failed stretch goals on auto insurance is broken. Speaker, We congratulate our PC member from, from uh, Milton for his work on this file. He will, introduce, he will be introducing legislation that, if passed, will eliminate the unfair practice of postal code discrimination with respect to auto insurance rates. His proposed initiative, Speaker, is a great way to combat discrimination in our auto insurance system. Once the member's legislation is tabled, we look forward to working with him and the industry stakeholders <clears throat> to ensure our auto insurance system meets the needs of Ontarians, Ontario's 10 million drivers. Speaker, he has done this right. Once. He consulted with stakeholders right across the province and put forward a great private member's bill. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, 
Ontario has one of the lowest levels of auto accidents in Canada, yet the most expensive auto insurance premiums. While the government should be working hard to fix the situation, the Premier has instead continued with the Liberals' policy, which has failed dri drivers for too long and paves the way for a 9 per cent increase in average pre pre premiums paid by drivers. We need to be moving forward, not backwards. Will the government support my private member's bill and stop allowing premiums to be based on where you live? Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The previous Liberal government, backed by the NDP, failed to deliver anything but stretch goals when it came to auto insurance rates. Our member from, uh, uh, from Milton's bill <coughs> Speaker, our members from Mil Milton's bill, if passed, uh, the bill will end the unfair practice of discriminating against drivers simply based on where they live. Our government for the people is committed to putting more money in people's pockets, and this bill is another step towards doing that, and we congratulate the member from Milton. Next question. Member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, with the recent tornadoes that affected many families throughout Ottawa region, we've heard of the many difficulties faced by our dedicated emergency responders during their response efforts. The communications infrastructure that our hard-working frontline officers and emergency personnel rely upon to respond to emergency situations is in a terrible state of disrepair. Speaker, through you. Could the minister please explain to all members of this legislature what he is doing to ensure that Ontario's emergency communications infrastructure is improved? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Carleton for the question. As you've heard today, our government has taken real action to address Ontario's crumbling public safety radio network, a system relied upon by many of the province's frontline officers and emergency responders. Replacing this outdated and ineffective radio network is critical to all emergency services throughout the province. When Ottawa was shaken by the tragic tornadoes, our hard-working and dedicated frontline officers and emergency responders were obstructed from performing their duties safely and effectively due to the frequent outages that affected the PSRN on a daily basis. In an emergency situation, Mr. Speaker, regardless of where it is in the province, communication between our frontline Response. and emergency responders is a key component to ensuring public safety and to also keep our emergency responders safe. Well, so. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I thank the minister for his response. It's reassuring to know that our government for the people, under Premier Ford's leadership, is taking the necessary steps to ensure that public safety is enhanced and restored throughout the province. Our hard-working and dedicated frontline officers and emergency personnel deserve to have the tools they need to keep all of Ontario's communities safe. Minister, as you know, frontline officers and emergency personnel throughout the province rely upon Ontario's public safety radio network. There has been constant concern over smaller, rural and northern communities like Richmond, Metcalf and Osgood when it comes to having the necessary tools and resources to perform their duties safely and effectively. To the Minister, could you please explain how modernizing the public safety radio network will help Question. those living in smaller, rural and northern communities in my riding of Carleton and across this great province? Minister. Thank you for that very good question. Uh, let me start off by saying that the Ontario Public Safety Radio Network is relied upon by more than 38,000 emergency responders throughout the province. It is the largest, most complex net in all of North America, but it was one of the last ones that has been left to comply with the P25 standard in North America. 
This modernization project will ensure that our more than 38,000 frontline officers and first responders, including OPP officers, paramedics, hospital staff, fire services, provincial highway maintenance staff, and even the province's conservation officers, can count on communications infrastructure, network and equipment they need when they respond to emergencies. This project will assist our hardworking frontline officers Fonts. and emergency responders throughout the province, becoming better equipped to keep our communities and families and businesses safe. Here, here. Thank you. Next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. A fully equipped medical trailer for overdose prevention in my riding of Parkdale High Park sits unused. As the weather worsens, volunteers who maintain the overdose prevention site decided last week that they had to close in order to keep the community safe. 189 people, and counting, have died in the 10 weeks since the government started its unnecessary review, given the evidence is already very clear. Speaker, with no sign of a decision, will the Premier finally tell the people of Parkdale High Park if the previously approved permanent site can operate safely and openly? Yes or no? Premier for Tourism. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you. The member opposite understands that we requested an extension from the federal government to study the problem and make sure we got it right. As the, uh, as the speaker knows, we received that extension from the federal government. We're going to study it. We're going to get it right. I think it's very important for people to understand any discussion about mental Order. health and addictions must include a conversation about opioid crisis. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. People are dying while this government dithers. Three people a day die from preventable overdoses. Regardless of whether the Premier is, quote, dead set, and quote, against these sites, it is a proven harm reduction tool that saves lives. I ask again, will the Premier allow health professionals already during the work of saving lives to do it safely from community health clinics? Yes or no? Minister. You know, I think the member opposite is, is frankly just reinforcing the point that we need to get this right. This is not a knee-jerk reaction. This is not a let's throw money at it. I know it's always the NDP solution, but frankly, there are better ways. Order. We need to make sure that the treatment is in place. We will study this and we will get it right and we will not be rushed Order. because you want to make a snap decision. Next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Mr. Speaker. My Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Today marks the beginning of Small Business Week. After 15 years of red tape, overregulation and excessive taxation, I know I speak on behalf of all the small businesses in my community yes. when I say how special this Small Business Week is. We know, Mr. Speaker, businesses are the backbone of Ontario's economy. Small business owners are hardworking people. They get up early, they work late, they take great risks and create jobs in communities across our great province. Our government is committed to helping small businesses success, succeed, create the right conditions, and to help them thrive. Question. When small businesses prosper, Ontario prosper. Prospers. Could the minister please inform the legislature how our government for the people is helping small business owners after 15 years of hardship under the previous Liberal government? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, my honourable colleague for this uh, very important question. Yes, uh, this is uh, Small Business Week in Ontario, and we celebrate the jobs, the uh, food that's put on the table by our small businesses, the families that have great lives, those that come off welfare and work for business and make their way up, as the Premier said. But you know, Mr. Speaker, while well, this week is Small Business Week officially, every week is Small yeah. Business Week. For this in fact, every day is Small Business Week. Oh, it's Small Business Day with this government. 
We have over 400,000 small businesses in the province of Ontario, and they account for about 90 per cent of the actual businesses in our provinces. Ontario small businesses employ nearly 2 million people, and our government is making sure, making sure every day that they're able to uh, thrive prosper and employ more Ontarians. And we're doing that by scrapping the Response. cap and trade if passed, the Green Energy Act's being scrapped if passed, we removed the carbon tax from the price of natural gas, lowered the gas tax by 4.3 cents with more to come, Mr. Speaker, committed to lowering corporate tax. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. Mr. Speaker, our number one priority of this government is ensuring Ontario is open for business. We are making it easier in this province to grow a business by cutting red tape and regulatory burdens. In fact, the PA was just in my riding and held an excellent roundtable with small businesses on this very thing. We've heard from businesses across this province that they need relief. Business resources shouldn't be spent, Mr. Speaker, improve on improving and innovating, not clearing regulatory hurdles. Far too many provincial regulations are inflexible, inefficient, and quite frankly, duplicative. Question. Or simply out of date, Mr. Speaker, misaligned with so many jurisdictions across this province across this country, and we're paying higher bills for this. Could the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade please inform this legislature how our government for the people is— Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Minister? Thank you, uh, thank you again to my colleague for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, our government is taking serious uh, action to reduce the burden of red tape and to send the message that Ontario is indeed open for business. Uh, my parliamentary assistants, uh, uh, Donna Kelly and our parliamentary assistant, Mike Parsa. Don has been doing the uh, free trade. Uh, what's the effect of uh, free trade, the NAFTA negotiations on our small businesses and all our businesses? And PA Mark, Mike Parsa has been doing an excellent job, as was mentioned in the question, of uh, uh, listening to businesses so we can cut red tape. Mr. Speaker, we're not just having these meetings for the sake of meetings. That's what other governments do. We're having these meetings so that we will cut red tape, not down the centre like 50 per cent, like so many cut it in half. We're going to cut it right off in this process. We're going to create more jobs. The Premier, the Premier has uh, appointed a special deputy minister to do exactly that, to look at the uh, regulatory burden in the province. And historically, Mr. Speaker, we've saved small businesses and all businesses one point five million. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Windsor, to come see. Speaker, my question is to the Environment Minister, the former head of the OLG. Good morning, Minister. Speaker, the minister tweeted last week that he's cut a deal in his riding to keep 500 slot machines at Ajax Downs. Even though a new mega casino was opening up just 10 minutes away in Pickering. So, Speaker, what's the deal? Has the government reintroduced the slots at Racetracks program right across the province or just in writings held by the cabinet ministers? I didn't get that. Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. The Minister of Finance. I didn't get that. Minister of Finance. Thank much, uh, <clears throat> for the question. Our government has kept its commitment to bolster the horse racing industry and repair the damage done by the previous Liberal government with the support of the NDP. Speaker, agreements in principle have now been reached to keep slots operating in Kawartha Downs and Ajax Downs and to provide additional funding to continue horse racing in Fort Erie and Dresden. Discussions continue with other racetracks in Ontario. Speaker, this commitment will directly support the horse racing industry and rural Ontario. This is certainly another promise made, promise kept. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, there's great confusion at Kawartha Downs. Employees were locked out this morning. Wow. The Premier said on Friday the slots would stay at Kawartha Downs, even though a new casino was opening up in Peterborough tonight. But there seems to be a communications breakdown. Racetrack management has told the union if all of the slots aren't open by tomorrow, layoff notices will be issued. The OLG and Great Canadian Gaming apparently aren't doing what the Premier said they were going to do. Speaker, 
Who's calling the shots in this province, the government or private casino operators? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Our government made a generous offer to all of the racetracks, including uh, offering the return of slots to Fort Erie and Dresden. These racetracks uh, in those areas made a business decision to take further uh, enhanced funding as opposed to opening their slots. Speaker, we're committed to supporting horse racing in Ontario, and we're listening to the needs of the industry stakeholders, something that the member across the aisle should well do. You know, Speaker, it's, it's difficult when you deal with the NDP. They deal in chaos. We deal in confidence, Speaker. They deal in resistance. We deal in results. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, member for Markham Stouffville. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, my question today is for the Minister of Community, uh, uh, Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, I know the members for uh, Simcoe North and Carleton have already asked this question, but given how important the public safety network is to uh, our frontline officers and our emergency service workers, I think it bears asking again, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the system is in a terrible state of disre disrepair, Mr. Speaker, and we know how important this is for our frontline workers, how important it is to keeping our communities across this province safe, Mr. Speaker. I wonder if the minister could once again share with us what his ministry is doing to address this critical problem, this critical lack of infrastructure that is so important for the people of Ontario. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the member for that question. Last week, as many of you know, Mr. Speaker, I was proud to stand alongside the Premier of the province and the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade to announce our government's plans to replace Ontario's crumbling public safety radio network. As I stated, there hasn't been an update to this network for over 20 years. Our network is crumbling to the extent that our emergency responders are scouring Kijiji just to find parts to keep their radios in working order. This is simply unacceptable. Our government is taking action to ensure that more than 38,000 of our frontline workers can count on communications infrastructure, network, and equipment they need when responding to emergencies. During the election campaign, Mr. Speaker, we committed to providing our frontline officers with the tools and resources they require to perform their duties safely and effectively. Promises made, promises, promises kept. Here, here. Supplementary. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Minister, for the answer, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's shocking, really, that uh, Liberals, both federally and provincially, seem to take the safety and security of, uh, of uh, our province and country so lightly. Whether it was a decade of darkness for our Canadian Armed Forces that the federal Liberal gave, Liberals gave us, or 15 years to repair a public safety network and make investments in public safety, Mr. Speaker, that is completely unacceptable. And part of the reason why the people of Ontario elect progressive Conservatives on this side of the house and on that side of the house to make these important changes, Mr. Speaker. It is absolutely disheartening. It's disheartening to hear that our frontline officers and workers have to go out and buy spare parts to keep their radios working, Mr. Speaker. That's not what the people of Ontario expect, and I'm very proud to be part of a government for the people, Mr. Speaker, that are making investments like this. I wonder if the minister could share for the House and for the people of Ontario just why this is such an important investment to make in order to keep our communities safe. Minister. To the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Health. I want to thank uh, the member for the question, and I also want to thank our Premier and the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services for their commitment in taking the necessary steps to modernize the province's public safety radio network. So I want to thank them for that. These upgrades are urgent, urgently needed, as was seen during the recent, recent tornadoes that affected numerous families in the Ottawa region. The PSRN is a vital tool used by our, our emergency responders. It assists with protecting the life safety of the general public and also the workers themselves. That's why our government is now taking the necessary steps 
to modernize and to upgrade the yep. province's public safety Spons. radio network so that we can prevent any further challenges faced by emergency responders and our municipal partners. Again, I want to thank the Premier and the Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Mr. Speaker, for five years I have stood in this House and said clearly that any long-term future for the Fort Erie racetrack must include the return of slots. The community and the town have said the same thing. Yet on Friday night, after 5 o'clock, this Conservative government quietly put out a press release that said in a closed door deal the government would not return the slots to Fort Erie. Instead, instead, they're going to give cash or a buyout. Oh, shame. Mr. Shame. Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. When? Shame. When? Did the minister or the premier consult either an elected representative or the people of the town of Fort Erie on this deal? When did you talk? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much uh, for the question. We are pleased that the member opposite recognizes, uh, finally recognizes the uh, importance of the horse racing industry after the uh, Liberal government took it apart with only thanks to the support of the NDP. Order. However, the member may want to take time to acknowledge the industry's real needs. We made a generous offer to return slots to Fort Erie, but yes. the racetrack themselves Refuse. made a business decision to accept enhanced funding instead. We are committed Order. to supporting the horse racing industry in Ontario. The member opposite would be wise to listen to his own riding. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, let me say very clearly, I do not to take any lessons from that member on what to do on the racetrack in Fort Erie. I've been fighting for that track for five years and to make sure we get the slots back. That's what I've done, and you know that as a member. You know that. Mr. Speaker, back, back to the environmental conservation and parks. For five years, I have been clear. The future of the Fort Erie racetrack must include slots and the jobs. That would mean much needed revenue, but also hundreds, hundreds of new jobs for the town of Fort Erie. Jobs that the residents can raise their families on. Instead, this closed door deal has resulted in the trade of dollars instead of slots. The mayor, Question. the councillor, my office didn't agree to this. And most importantly, the residents of Fort Erie were not even told about this. So the people of Fort Erie can know. Will the minister re-examine re this deal, ensure that the slots can return to the Fort Erie racetrack, just like the premier, just like the premier promised? Thank you. Minister. They don't want them. Minister. They don't want them. Thank you. Uh, Opposition benches come to order. Minister, respond. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, our government has kept its commitment to bolster the horse racing industry and repair the damage done by the previous Liberal government only due to the support of the NDP. We made a generous offer to return slots to Fort Erie, Opposition but the racetrack made order. a business decision to accept the enhanced funding instead. This commitment will directly support the horse racing industry and rural uh, communities. Our government made a generous offer to all of these racetracks, including offering the return of slots to Fort Erie and Dresden. Speaker, I'm going to say it again. The, un the NDP deals in chaos. We deliver confidence. Yes. The NDP deals in resistance. We will deliver results. Question period has expired.
Point of order, the member for Don Valley East. I just want to take a moment to recognize the students from Don Mills Collegiate who were in the assembly today. Thank you very much. I beg to inform the House that the following document has been tabled, the 2016-2017 Annual Report of the Office of the Chief Electoral Officer of Ontario. There being no deferred votes, point of order, the member for King Vaughan. Pardon me, Mr. Speaker. I also want to recognize students from St. Raphael the Archangel from Vaughan who were with us earlier today. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House is recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.